In the last session, we looked at the first multiplication narrative in Mark, discussed the divine appearance narrative of the walking on water, and ended with a discussion of the debate between the Pharisees and Jesus concerning the tradition of the elders. In this session, we see Jesus move outside the territory of Israel to encounter a woman who is non-Jewish, a Syrophoenician to be exact. Then, the curi after curing a deaf mute, he encounters another large crowd of about 4,000 whom he feeds with seven loaves. Jesus and his disciples cross back to Jewish territory, during which a discussion ensues about the fact that they have no bread on board. After disembarking, Jesus and his disciples come upon a blind man who requests a cure. This leads immediately into the famous confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, with the first prediction of the Passion, and the comments on the meaning of discipleship addressed to the crowds following him. This session will end with the Transfiguration narrative. The narrative of the encounter with the Syrophoenician woman provides us with an interesting view of Jesus. It's an encounter with a woman who will not take, take no for an answer. Her daughter is deathly ill, possessed by a demon, and she knows that Jesus can do something about it, and she will not stop until he does. This is a model of persistence in faith. A look at the map shows that the area just north of Galilee is Phoenicia, whose main city is Tyre. The part of Phoenicia near Syria, which you can see in the extreme upper right, Hence, the area is properly known as Syro-Phoenicia. In this region, the encounter takes place. The text tells us from the locale where the debate with the Pharisees took place, Jesus went north toward Tyre and Sidon. He leaves his homeland, departing from Jewish territory. He freely enters a house, and so it is probably probable that he did have acquaintances in the area. He's seeking a respite from the ministry. Yet Mark tells us that he was not able to escape notice. Even in this foreign territory, he was recognized. On the contrary, in typical Markan style, immediately a woman whose daughter was sick with an unclean spirit had heard about him. She approaches, falling at his feet, similar to Jairus. The woman is described as a Gentile, a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. So we move from Jesus acting on behalf of his fellow countrymen to acting on behalf of those who are foreign, even Gentile. How will Jesus react to this woman? She initiates the conversation, asking him to cast the demon from her daughter. Now, we know that this is not a major difficulty for Jesus. What's new here is the person who is asking. Jesus' response is quite out of character. Let the children <clears throat> be satisfied first, he says. It's clear here that the children are the Jewish people. Being filled has to do with God's preference of the Jews in history. They are and have been known as the people of God. The first implies that even though they are God's people, the Jews do not have an exclusive claim, as Paul notes to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles in Romans 1.16. So Jesus seems to leave that door open. But he continues, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This would be considered to be quite insulting. He's setting out a preference for the ministry to the Jews, referring to those who are not part of that ministry as dogs. Now the word used is kunarion, which refers to a domesticated house pet rather than a wild sheepdog, etc. But still, it's quite biting. Jesus has ref refused her request because of who she is, a Gentile.
but the woman doesn't take any offense. Her desire is the exorcism of her daughter and her daughter's health and well-being. So without missing a beat, she comes right back at Jesus. She begins her retort with the polite address, Lord, and continues, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She's not asking for much, only a small favor. She recognizes the children's prerogative and the secondary nature of the dog's claim. Jesus is operating out of an analogy that food is meant for the children. The woman responds that even the children share their food. How often do we see children at a table giving food, especially food they don't like, to the house pet under the table? The woman has bested Jesus at his own game, it seems. As a result, Jesus responds, telling the woman to go. Her request has been answered. The demon has left her daughter, and so the woman does as Jesus commanded, goes home and finds her daughter lying in bed with the demon gone. This narrative shows that Jesus does not restrict his ministry to Judaism alone. It's a foreshadowing of a greater ministry to the Gentiles after the resurrection. But it's also a narrative that speaks to the necessity of honesty, forthrightness, and persistence in prayer. The woman was dead set on getting what she wanted, and as a result, she was able to best Jesus at his own game and get it. How often are we willing to go that route? A further cure in the Gentile territory follows, a deaf mute. Mark has placed these two narratives in this position following the discussion with the Pharisees to show that the reception in Gentile areas is more positive than the reception among Jesus' own people. This will foreshadow the acceptance of the message of the apostles as they preach the word in the early church, Gentile acceptance, Jewish rejection. Jesus concludes his extra-Galilean ministry with another narrative of multiplication this time 4,000 men. Some Pharisees then come to Jesus demanding a sign to substantiate his claims. He and his disciples then get into the boat and cross back into Jewish territory. It's during this crossing that Jesus warns his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. The text begins with a rather unusual remark. In English, it's translated as they forgot to bring bread. They had only one loaf. Now, if they had one loaf, then they had bread. But in Greek, oh, there's that Greek again, it has a plural for bread, artus. So the sentence really means they forgot to bring more than one loaf of bread. They had only one. This becomes an occasion for Jesus to warn the disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. If you recall, the Pharisees and Herod have been joined once before in this gospel at Mark 3, 6, where they plotted that they might, how they might destroy Jesus. It's safe, therefore, to think that the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod is the slowly sp spreading plot on their part to get rid of Jesus. This is truly something the disciples need to be aware of and be on guard against, as the Greek verb blepita connotes. The disciples seemingly do not hear the admonition of Jesus and continue to discuss the fact that they don't have breads. Recall then in chapter 2 with the cure of the paralytic, it was the Pharisees who were discussing among themselves. Now the disciples seem to be doing what the Pharisees did. Jesus then turns the topic to their concern and asks a question very similar to the one he asked the Pharisees in chapter 2 to show that he was aware of their discussion. Why are you discussing the fact that you don't have multiple loaves of bread? 
Then he rephrases the question using a significant number of verbs of sight, insight, and perception. Perceive, understand, see, and hear. He says, do you neither perceive nor understand? In other words, don't you get it? Or perhaps they're blocking it. Are your hearts hardened? That was the description used for the disciples last session after the storm at sea. Then, citing a version of Isaiah 6 that has already been cited in chapter 4, he asks, Having eyes, do you not see? This is a reference to the next narrative of the cure of a blind man. And having ears, do you not hear? This is a reference to the preceding cure of the deaf mute that we mentioned. Then Jesus tries to lead them to get it, recalling the two narratives involving bread. Do you remember, he asks, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? That's the multiplication text in chapter six. How many baskets of full fragments did you take up? They answer twelve. They do indeed remember. And the seven loaves for the four thousand. That's the multiplication that we skipped at the beginning of chapter eight. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Again, they remember and answer seven. And so I can just see Jesus at this point saying to the disciples, then do the math. Five loaves, five thousand, twelve baskets. Seven loaves, four thousand, seven baskets. One loaf, twelve? How much left over? If their problem is only one loaf of bread, they have the one who can resolve the problem in the boat with them. Why don't they bring the problem to him rather than discussing a solution among themselves? And so Jesus ends the text with a climactic, do you not yet understand? The disciples are getting more and more blind and less and less aware. This is where Mark is absolutely brilliant because of, on the heels of this text, of their inability to see, grasp, or understand, who does he introduce into the text but a blind man who happens to be at Bethsaida in a somewhat brilliant stroke. Mark chooses to surround the central section of the gospel where he explains the meaning of Jesus' messiahship with two miracles of curing blindness. Given the placement of the first narrative, the blind man has to be symbolic of the disciples. Mark introduces this narrative with a very simple, they came to Bethsaida, that is Jesus and his disciples. From the map, we can see that Bethsaida is located at the extreme north of the Sea of Galilee. Here it's called Bethsaida Julius. The actual narrative begins with people were bringing to him a blind man, and they entreat him to touch the blind man in order that he might restore his sight. Jesus accedes to their request and takes the hand of the blind man and leads him outside of the village. This is similar to the cure of the deaf mute. There are several characteristics of the wonder worker tradition that appear in this narrative. The leading away from the public eye is seen by some as a means of concealing the means of healing so that the wonder worker can do his work. The next details are also from the wonder worker tradition. Once out of the village, Jesus puts saliva on his eyes. Some translators choose a more graphic, he spat on his eyes. Saliva was seen to have healing abilities. And then Jesus laid his hands on him. These actions in the wonder worker tradition were seen to have almost magical capabilities. But here, in Jesus' case, it's actually the action of God that is the healing agent. Finally, Jesus asks the blind man if he sees anything. In other words, has the cure worked? The description of what the man sees would be a verification of the miracle. The man regains his sight and responds to Jesus' question, I see men, he says. 
That is, I see them as walking trees. Now that's a rather peculiar answer for one who has regained sight. It lets the reader know that his sight is there, but it's not clear. He's seeing things in a rather blurred manner. Jesus realizes the same, and he again places his hand upon the man. It seems as though the first attempt didn't work as it should. This time, the desired effect is achieved. The blind man sees clearly. His sight is restored. The implication is that he was restored to an earlier condition of sight. This is not the case of a person born blind who never saw. Rather, it's one who had the ability to see and through some misfortune lost that ability and now has it restored. The narrative ends with the man being sent home without even entering the village. Placed at this significant juncture in the narrative of Mark, this cure looks back on the blindness of the disciples, manifest on their discussion on the of the bread in the boat, but also looks forward to the insight of Peter, which will come in the next text. The setting for the next narrative is an area around the villages of Caesarea Philippi, which from the map we discover is located in the extreme northern regions of Israel. Today that region is known as the Golan Heights. This is the area where the Jordan River begins. As Jesus and his disciples are traveling, he was asking the identity question, who do people say that I am? Literally say me to be. In other words, what's the popular opinion about Jesus' identity? Here's a picture of the area around Caesarea Philippi. The water is the beginning of the Jordan River. The large opening into the cave of the remains of a te temple to the Greek god Pan, whose worship was popular in that region. The Greek god gave his name to the region, Panium, which was later corrupted to Banyas. The disciples answer that some of the people felt that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to life, since many of his teachings were similar to those of John. However, there were others who thought that Jesus was Elijah. This goes back to a tradition that developed after Elijah was taken into heaven on the whirlwind, that he would return just before the Messiah came. That tradition exists to this very day in the custom of setting a place for Elijah at the Seder table. And there were others who thought that Jesus was one of the prophets. This goes back to a tradition found in the book of Deuteronomy, that at the end times a prophet like Moses would arise to explain all things to the people. So the answer to Jesus' question spanned most of the popular expectations of the day. So. He posed another question with a slight change. You, who do you say that I am? And be, after being with Jesus several months, even years, what's the disciples' estimation of him? Peter answers immediately, you are the Messiah, the Christ. This is the final expectation that someone of the Davidic line would appear to banish the Romans and restore the monarchy, bringing Israel back to the prestige and glory that it had under the monarchy of David. This is the first time that this title, Christ or Messiah, has been used since the opening verse of the Gospel. So Peter has identified Jesus as the one who will restore the kingdom. This is a very political understanding, but one that was nevertheless popular among the people. However, following the two-stage cure of the blind man, we can infer that Mark wants to tell the reader that Peter's understanding is a bit blurred, skewed, if you will. And that would explain why Jesus charges the disciples not to speak to anyone concerning him, 
what they understand by Messiah is not what he sees Messiah as. What we saw at the beginning of the gospel is now to be explained in detail. This is confirmed almost immediately when Jesus changes the subject to speak of the suffering and re rejection of the Son of Man. Note, we said that Son of Man was the title that Jesus chose to use of himself. Thus, he will not speak of his royal messianic reign, which Peter seemingly expected, but rather of his suffering and death, which is his understanding of Messiah. In a somewhat detailed account, Jesus announces that he must, no, this is a necessity, not a possibility, suffer many things, be rejected by official Judaism, that is, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be put to death or killed, and rise three days later. Mark tells us that he spoke these things plainly. He's not mincing words here. He's telling the disciples what he means by Messiah. However, this is not what they expect. This is certainly not the meaning of Messiah that Peter had in mind when he made his climactic declaration. So, Peter sees the need to correct Jesus. He takes Jesus off to the side and corrects or rebukes him. Notice that verb, epitimao, rebuke. We can almost see Peter saying, Lord, this is not the way it is with messiahs. They don't suffer and die. They reign in glory. But Jesus turns and sets Peter straight while glancing at the same time at the rest of the disciples, who I presume are thinking the same way as Peter. Mark then tells us that Jesus rebuked Peter. Now, if you recall, that the verb rebuke, epitimao, has as its object some form of the demonic, as we've seen earlier in the gospel, demons, storms, illnesses, etc. So here, Peter is the object of the rebuke. So its use here infers that Jesus sees Peter's attempt to dissuade him as demonic. The text confirms this because he says, Get behind me, you Satan. The command in Greek is literally, get after me. Get, opis, hupaga, behind me, opiso mu. Recall that the invitation to become a disciple given to Peter in chapter 1 was, come after me. It used the same prepositional phrase, which we explained there was a technical term for discipleship. Thus, Jesus is commanding Peter to not be in league with Satan, but rather get back in line with the decision he made when he left all to follow Jesus. Jesus is telling Peter and is telling us that being a follower of Jesus means accepting suffering and possibly ultimate death. Jesus concludes this discussion with Peter by telling him what he thinks about royal messiahship in Jesus. He looks, he's looking at things from a human point of view. He's considering the things of man. But rather, God's point of view is something quite different, the things of God. Peter must not consider the things of God, the things, does, is not considering the things of God, but rather the things of men. Hence, he sees things blurredly. Christ is calling him to see this clearly. Jesus then turns to the crowd that's been gathering and tells them what discipleship really means. To be a follower of Jesus means trial, means suffering, means accepting the cross. It is a denial of self. It is the cross. It is following Jesus on the journey he now begins. If someone wishes to come after me, that is, be my disciple, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. This means that the true disciple of Jesus will put his or her own desires and wants in second place to discipleship. That may at times involve embracing the cross in whatever form it may present itself. 
Both of these are necessary if one is to be a true follower of Jesus. Then, in a couple of paradoxical statements, Jesus notes that failure to do this in favor of preserving one's life as it is known will only lead to death and failure. The statements are connected to the Declaration on Denial as a reason for the denial and acceptance of the cross. For, Jesus says, whoever would wish to save his life will lose it. We can imply in this statement that saving life is life as we now know it, preserving the status quo. When one says that they want the life of Jesus as a follower, yet will not give up their life as they know it, they will ultimately lose their life eternally. And so also with the corollary. Whoever would lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. The one who is willing to give up the status quo for the sake of following Jesus and the gospel will preserve or save their life into eternity. It's only when we put these statements on the dual plane of life here on earth as we know it, an eternal life, that these statements of Jesus make sense. As we saw at the beginning of the Gospel, discipleship is intimately tied in with Jesus. That intimate tie will become more explicit as we move through this section. The final unit to be discussed in this session is the Transfiguration narrative. To provide hope for the disciples in what seems right now a hopeless venture, Jesus permits them to see his transfigured glory, what awaits him at the end of the journey and his mission. The text begins noting that there is a delay in time of six days between this narrative and the preceding. Jesus takes the three special disciples who were with him at the raising of the daughter of Jairus to a high mountain to be apart by themselves. It's generally believed that the Mount of the Transfiguration was Mount Tabor, as shown in this picture. Yet there are some who believe that it was Mount Hermon to the north, which is higher yet, but most accept Mount Tabor as the site. Mark tells us that Jesus was transfigured before them. Metamorphothe is the Greek word from which we get metamorphosis, that is a change of shape. So Jesus' shape or form was changed. That change is described as his garments becoming glisteningly white, whiter than any bleach could make them. For those with the translation fuller, that's what a fuller is, one who works with bleach. Moses and Elijah, the representatives of the law, Moses and the prophets, that is the old order, the old covenant, appear with Jesus in this vision. Here are some pictures of what you will see if you travel to Mount Tabor today. Atop the mountain, which is usually approached by a taxi cab, although walking is permitted, is a beautiful church whose facade is seen in this shot. Upon entering the church, one can see the upper church with its striking mosaic in the apse and down below the steps going to the lower church where pilgrim groups can have mass. The mosaic itself portrays Jesus transfigured with Peter, James, and John on the outside witnessing the event. Moses and Elijah stand on either side of Jesus and underneath the mosaic in Latin is the caption and he was transfigured before them. Finally, a view of the surrounding region from atop Mount Tabor. The first response to the, of the disciples to the experience is from Peter. He approves with the statement, it is good for us to be here. I can almost hear him saying, now this is what being Messiah is all about. It is so good that Peter wants the experience to remain. And so he continues, let us build three booths, that is tents. Why would you build a tent unless you plan to stay? And who are these tents for? One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. 
Mark notes that Peter did not know how he should respond because he with the others were afraid. This was an experience beyond all that Peter could grasp. So in essence, he was speechless. The next word is not human but divine, as in the baptismal narrative. A cloud overshadows them, and a voice from the cloud speaks, repeating in essence what was said at the baptism. This is my beloved son. But a command is added to the statement, listen to him. What they are to hear, or what are they to hear? The last things that Mark has recorded was the prediction of the necessity of the passion and the qualifications of being a follower. The voice speaking the command listen at this juncture then is affirming what Jesus has said about his future and the future of the disciples. In unusual Markan style, he changes his adverb. Now it's suddenly rather than immediately. The three disciples look up suddenly and see no one except Jesus with them. The vision has come to an end. They descend the mountain and Jesus orders them to tell no one of this experience until he, the Son of Man, has risen from the dead. This vision experience had been for the benefit of the disciples who witnessed it to show them what was on the other side of Jesus being handed over and his death. This was to give them courage in the moment of Jesus' prediction coming to fulfillment. But even here there has been misunderstanding with Peter wanting to hold on to the experience. It takes a voice from heaven to get him to let go. And finally the disciples end the narrative questioning what rise from the dead means. They just don't get what Jesus is about and what he's trying to accomplish. The journey from blindness to sight will continue in the next session. We will have further un misunderstanding of the disciples and the cure of the young boy with an unclean spirit. Jesus will give a second prediction of his upcoming passion, only to be misunderstood by the disciples who are only interested in who will have power. We will look at the antidotes to temptation that Jesus gives and end the session with a discussion of marriage and divorce.